and cut it. And Could you please try now? Uh, let me see. Share screen. Yeah. It. You see what happens now. Uh, please try now. What do you? Yeah. You can see my presentation now, eh? Uh, not yet. Uh huh. Oh, sorry. Share. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we still have uh, some time. I started the uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, we have a couple of minutes to wait. That's but I, I also see your um, presenter, you. So all your slides and everything. You see the picture. Oh, okay. Let me see. Okay. Let me change that. Then I uh, will just a slideshow, set it to show, browse individual window. And now if I do this, yeah. This is better. Uh, now I see one slide. That's good. Okay. So let me just see because I'm pretty sure that. Now it's gone. Uh, yeah, I have to, uh, I have to uh, reshoot share. I think. Okay. Why doesn't that work? Okay. Stop share. I will share it again now. Um, this one, share. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have also followers on YouTube. Do you, do you see my mouse, sir, by the way? Yes. Okay, great. And this works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me do it like that. Okay. Good. Uh, one more time. Oh, yeah, it's still working. It's still working. Okay. <clears throat> we are almost uh, ready to start. That's yeah. a couple of more minutes so that uh, people can join. Okay. Let me just uh, grab some uh, water. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, how is life in Delft? Very busy. It's the exam season and the resets next week. Uh, oh, yeah. A lot of grading. <laughs> uh, I see that uh, people are attending slowly, but uh, I suggest that we start. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Zeki Akin from Delft University of Technology. And this is the monthly webinar for IEEE Signal Processing Society, especially for the Information Forensics and Security Technical Committee. So welcome. Today we have a distinguished uh, speaker, uh, Professor Richard Hosdens uh, from Netherlands Defense Academy, the Netherlands. Um, the talk will be about distributed optimization, but the privacy preserving distributed optimization. Uh, Richard, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Um, please introduce yourself, your research, and um, the floor is yours. I will also start the uh, recording as well. Okay, thank you, Zeki, for the 
invitation. Okay, my name is Richard Heustens, and I'm a professor at the Netherlands Defense Academy and also still uh, have a guest position at Delft University of Technology. And my main interest now is in uh, distributed optimization and in particular the privacy issues that uh, will uh, appear there. So the talk today will be on this privacy preserving optimization and in particular I will also take a look to um, communication efficient algorithms. Um, let me see. Okay. So because of the growing amount of available data that uh, you will see all around you, um, that will introduce now some challenges in storage, but also the processing of the data. And traditionally, if you look to networks, they all have a centralized or star structure. And there are some problems with those structures because um, uh, there is a reliability problem, because if you remove the central node from the network, actually, then the whole network is down. There's also a scalability problem because such a server can handle an X number of nodes, uh, agents, uh, but if the number actually scales, then actually you have uh, actually a problem. Uh, not only um, in, in hardware, but also the communication cost can grow because if the sensors or the agents or the nodes, whatever it will be, are geographically spread, then actually you have to communicate over a long distance to exchange information with the server. And that long distance communication actually requires a lot of communication power. Now, those problems will be partly, mainly actually solved if you look to distributed networks, so decentralized networks. So what do I mean by that? Now, let me just take an example here. And this is an example of federated learning. And on the left, you see a centralized network. So all the data that is stored in this case, uh, for example, on smartwatches, or it could be a mobile phone or a laptop or whatever sensor it is, it should be communicated to, in this case, a hospital where a global model needs to be learned based on data that actually is distributed in the network. Now, an alternative structure actually that avoids, for example, long distance communication is the one on the right hand side. And there you see that the nodes or the agents or in this case patients actually are just locally interconnected and by just locally exchanging information you can still pass information through the network and if the algorithms actually are clever uh, in, the, in, the, in such a network you can still solve the same problem as you did in this centralized way. Now there are also other examples where you need decentralized um, solutions and actually because uh, you have to, it's not possible to solve certain problems centralized. And here is an example, for example, for smart grids, where you would like to control the well, the voltage power, for example, at the outlets. And in the past, this was a well, relatively easy job. Uh, you did it at the power plant and actually that was it. But now you have so many sources of energy, actually, solar panels on your roof, that the control of such a network has to be done in some kind of decentralized manner. Now those networks, and also the two actually I showed you before, they lack infrastructure. Typically they are ad hoc. Yeah, there is no regular uh, infrastructure here. They also exhibit unpredictable dynamics in the sense that nodes or agents or patients in this case can just drop out of the network. For example, they run out of batteries, something like that. The networks are typically heterogeneous in the sense that the, well, the nodes could consist of different things like smart watches and mobile phones and laptops and so on different brands they all operate at different clock frequencies so that complicates things seriously in, in some cases and last but not least actually those networks they face resource constraints and um, because typically the nodes or the devices they run on the battery and well you would like to 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 use your device as long as possible now if you then look to algorithms that uh, should operate in this type of networks they need to be simple and simple because as we will see later on, typically the algorithms are iterative. So you meet many iterations actually before convergence. So all the operations itself should be simple. It has to be asynchronous and that has to do with the heterogeneous character of all the nodes there. They all operate at different clock frequencies. So you do, you do not want to have a global clock in the network. 
it has to be robust against network dynamics. So people will move around. So what is your neighbor at one moment in time? And a neighbor actually is in this case defined as the one you can communicate with. So the one who is within your communication range. That will depend because if you move around, then actually sometimes you lose contact with other nodes and you make contact with new nodes. It should be resource efficient. Actually, that's already what I explained. And last but not least, and that will be an important part of this talk, uh, the algorithms need to be secure or privacy preserving. Yeah, so, well, what do we mean actually by secure or privacy preserving? So we need some kind of model for security. And basically we have two types of security models. And the first time, the first model actually is what we call computational security. And that's the case where the adversary is assumed to be computationally bounded. So you cannot, well, decrypt a secret efficiently. Well, in polynomial time. And an example for this is, for example, RSA encryption. And the second model actually is about information theoretic security. And here, the adversary is assumed to be computationally unbounded, but he cannot infer anything about the secret because he doesn't have sufficient information. Yeah, now this actually is the one that we will focus in this presentation on, because the first one is typically communication and computationally demanding. And as I said before, it the algorithms that we are looking at are iterative in nature. So we have to repeat those processing over and over again. We go for the second type of security, information theoretical security. Well, actually it's already uh, quite often applied. And here are some examples of information theoretical security models. Um, first one is uh, secret sharing in secure multi-party computation. So what you do in secret sharing, actually you have your secret and you distribute the secret among participants and if only if a minimum number of participants um, come together actually you can find out what your original secret was now another example actually is that you can just add noise to obscure the data and actually in that way you can obtain what we call differential privacy so you add noise to the secrets and because you add noise, so you add uncertainty, actually, the information that you observe by the noisy secret actually will decrease in particular when you increase the variance of the noise. And then there's a third one, and actually I will talk about this in more detail later, that is that you can also obfuscate the secret by proper initialization of the iterative algorithms, actually. And, and, and this method is, is, is uh, referred to as Distributed optimization based subspace perturbation, or why it is called subspace perturbation, will become clear later in the talk. But the, um, uh, we will refer to this as DOSP, the DOSP algorithm. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we also talked about adversary models already. And what we will consider here are two types. And the first one is passive, and the other is the eavesdropper. Now, in the passive adversary model, we have a number of corrupted nodes in the network. We don't know which one it is, but they follow the protocol and they will just share information in order to infer the private data of honest nodes. And in the eavesdropping model, the adversary listens to, in this case, all communication channels. So I will assume that all channels actually will be eavesdropped with the purpose actually of inferring the private data. Yeah, so it's not only that nodes are corrupted, but we can also each eavesdrops all the communication channels. Now, in order to analyze the algorithms that we will discuss, uh, I will model the network as a graph. Yeah, and a graph actually consists of two sets, a set of nodes, calligraphic N, and a set of edges. And the edges basically are the communication channels. Yeah, so if you see the, the, the right button here, let me see if my, yeah, if my mouse is working. Here's a very simple example of a network containing five nodes. And there are edges. In this case, there's an edge between node one and two, indicated by this pair one, one, two, and also between one, three. But there is no edge, for example, between three, one and five, simply because the distance is, for example, too large, and five is not in the communication range of one, something like that. Okay, there's something that we also need later on is the symbol of a neighborhood of uh, a node, particular node I, and the neighborhood is defined as all other neighbors that have a communication link with that particular node. So if you just, in this example, I focus on node one, the neighborhood of node one is two and three, 
And if you look to node two, the neighborhood of node two is simply one, three, and four. That's that simple. Now, I also introduce here the degree of a node, and that actually is the number of neighbors that a node has. And I will not use it quite often, but later on in the equations, you will see the symbol actually, and then actually we know already what it is. Okay, just to give you a bit of a feeling what the adversaries will do. Well, there were two types. So you have the passive adversaries, adversaries. for example, here node two and node four are corrupted. They just follow the protocol. You don't notice anything from those adversaries, but they collect data actually, and using the collected data, they try to infer the secret for, of, for example, node one, which I consider to be an honest one. And in addition, we have eavesdroppers, and they just eavesdrop each and any communication channel here. There's everything that is transmitted in between the nodes is known by the adversary. That's the assumption here. Now let's then take a look to iterative optimization methods. Um, so what do they do? Well, actually, they compute a sequence of points, x0, x1, and so forth, where x0 is the initialization of the process. And they keep on iterating until actually the function value is minimized and actually it's minimized at the point x star so it's the optimal point the optimal solution you're looking for and the typical example of this one is the average consensus problem and how does that work actually well if we stack all the data in the network so from each and every node in a big factor x then actually we can calculate an update of this x factor at a new iteration based on the data in the previous iteration just by multiplying by this matrix. So basically here we have linear update equations. And the idea is that you initialize all the factors by a secret, which I just call AI here. So AI is local data in node I. And the goal here is to compute the average value. And I will use update equations like this. And what you can show if you properly design this W matrix, that this XK matrix indeed converges to the optimal factor. And the optimal factor in this case is a factor where each entry contains the average value of the AIs. This is what you are. Now, examples of this type of problems is distributed averaging. So you can just calculate the average over a set of nodes. This is, for example, also done in federated learning where you somehow want to combine, um, let's say, the local parameter information into a global uh, global parameter factor. Um, but you can also think about randomized gossip and in randomized gossip, a certain node in the network just starts to exchange information with only one neighbor, which it chooses, for example, randomly. Okay. Now, in order to determine how well the algorithm actually performs, uh, well, we need some measures and during the presentation here, I will just use two measures. And the first one is what we call output utility. And the output utility measures how close the factor X at iteration K is to the optimal one X star. And actually what I do here, I will just use the two norm, the two norm of the factor X, K and X. Simply. Now, how do we measure privacy then? Now, in this case, I will measure privacy by the mutual information uh, between the secret, let's call it S from now on, the secret SI, so the secret in node I, between the secret of SI and all the observed random variables by the adversaries. Yeah, now I have, so this is the mutual information. I can express it in terms of entropies, in this case, the Shannon entropy. So let's just assume for simplicity that the random variables are discrete uh, because then actually there's a little bit more interpretation uh, in, in the entropies. And what you see here, what is important here is that the mutual information between a secret at node i and all the observed data is a zero, if and only if the observed variables and the secret actually are statistically independent. So that's what we consider to be good. Yeah, so whatever, everything the adversaries know, you don't get any information about the secret in node i, if node i is an honest node. The other extreme actually is that when this um, mutual information is maximized, and when is it maximized? Actually, it must, it's maximized. If this SI can be calculated based on the observed data, if it can be calculated exactly. So if this is a one-to-one -one mapping. Now, in that case, actually, the mutual information will be equal to the uh, uncertainty in the secret itself, and that's the maximum value. Now, 
what we will see in practice or in practice in this presentation also i will use continuous random variables like gaussian noise now what we have to do there we have to replace the shannon entropy by differential entropies the only thing with differential entropy is that the interpretation is a little bit more complicated for example mutual information becomes infinitely large when there is a one-to-one -one mapping and things like that but what is the same in both cases is that we would like to make the mutual information as small as possible because then actually the information leakage actually is minimal <clears throat> now let's consider the, uh, the, 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 the 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 averaging example that i had so here i generated a, a random graph so 100 nodes randomly distributed i specifies the communication range and every node that falls in the communication range of another node actually forms a, a communication channel so that's the red lines and then you get a graph like this and so if you look to the output utility you see something like here so what i see here vertically i see the uh, actually the output utility as a function of the number of iterations and what you will see is actually if the iterations um, uh, proceed then you see that the utility becomes better and better and better and the error becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and in principle if you wait long enough you can make it infinitely small Question is, of course, then here, how about the privacy here? So what we need to do is to see what is the information that the adversaries know and how much information can they infer about my secrets at nodes, let's say node I. Well, if you then look to the mutual information between the secret in node I and everything that can be observed by the adversaries, well, first of all, the adversaries can eavesdrop each and every channel so they have knowledge of every X factor at every iteration. So they have at least knowledge of the factor X factor originating from node I at the initialization phase. And what is this? Actually, that was what I defined on the previous slide. You initialize this algorithm typically with the secret itself. So if you just look at the first iteration, what will be sent out by node I, that is exactly the secret. And you see that all information actually is already revealed in the first iteration here. So this algorithm, although it's quite nice and quite often used, um, it works well in the sense that the output utility goes to zero. So you get perfect output values, but there is no privacy at all. So how can we solve the problem? Well, one obvious way of solving this is we just add noise to the secret data. So instead of moving around as I through the network, I construct a new X, which is not S itself, but S plus noise, V is the noise. And what you can show then that if you want to have the mutual information between the secrets and the noisy secrets, if you want to have that smaller than a certain epsilon, then you can just calculate what will be the noise variance of a V to achieve that. Now, in this case, you can show that if the noise variance satisfies this equation actually then it's guaranteed that the mutual information between the secret s and the noisy data actually is less than or equal to this epsilon and epsilon can depend per application of course but the, the fact is that you can set epsilon i can tell you this is the variance and you add it and then actually the mutual information is sufficiently small now adding noise although sounds nice it has an effect on the output utility so what happens actually so we are calculating the average value but the data that we average is not now the secrets uh, the secret data only the ais in my network but i also average the noise of course and what you will see it in the end after convergence you see that all values in the factor x that you are not only the average value of the a's but on top of that you have the average value of course of the noise and then if you look to the output utility, which was the distance between xk minus the optimal one, in the limit, that goes to square root of n times the average noise value, which is clearly non-zero. Yeah, so an important conclusion here is that by just adding noise, there is a fundamental trade-off here between utility and privacy. Yeah, if you want to have more privacy, you need to add more noise, but more noise actually meets means that this one gets larger and larger and larger so the output utility goes down let's take a look now to the individual privacy what is it actually what you get if you just add noise now then we have to see what do the adversaries know well there actually are two types of adversaries first one we have the eavesdroppers and the eavesdroppers they can just observe 
all that is transmitted through the network, which are the access, and in this case, X is the noisy version of the sequence. But what they also know that, so here actually, this is an indication of these are the corrupted nodes, that all corrupted nodes know, of course, their own secrets, plus the noise that has been added. Now, if you then want to study what is the information release due to all the iteration, that seems quite complicated at the first sight, but actually it's not that complicated. And the reason that it is not that complicated is that all information from the secret at node i to the x value at iteration k goes through x iteration zero. And the reason is that once you have si, you can calculate si zero, you can calculate si1, you can calculate si2, and so on and so forth. So that means basically that if you know xi0, then there is no information between si and xik, assuming that there are no side paths that information can travel through the network. So if you then you look to the mutual information between the secret at node i and everything that is observed, that actually is equal to this mutual information between the secret and, well, actually only the first iteration, the, the, the xi at the first iteration, because I can calculate all the x guys at later iterations, plus everything that is known by the uh, passive adversaries. But as the secrets, that's what we assume, are just statistically independent among the nodes, and the noise that has been added is also statistically independent, those two, those parameters here at node j are statistically independent of what you see at node i. So this simply reduces to the mutual information between the secret at i and the noisy observation at the first iteration, which was si plus vi, yeah? the secret plus noise. So you see, yes, indeed, you get actually um, uh, a certain uh, amount of privacy because the mutual information becomes uh, smaller and smaller and smaller, the more noise you actually add. But on the other hand, you also saw that the utility actually becomes worse when there is more and more noise. Now, can we have perfect out of utility in this, this case? Yes, we can. Um, for example, if we add zero mean agoric noise, and what does that mean actually? Well, when n goes to infinity, so we have infinitely many nodes in the network, then the average value actually will become the expected value of the random variable, which is zero in this case. But, well, this, this seems, or seems it is quite unrealistic because n should go to infinity and n are the network, the number of, 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 let's say, participants in the network, which is typically not infinitely large. So what else can we do then uh, if we want to have perfect output utility? Well, actually, we can add zero sum noise. So noise for which the average value is exactly zero. Well, how can we do that? Well, for example, we can, uh, we can uh, um, uh, use a, a trusted third party who generates noise uh, realizations that add up to zero. Now, that is also quite undesired for large scale networks because you have to, well, at least uh, stay in contact with all the nodes. And the alternative actually is based on secret sharing. And the idea is the following. So every node now can generate certain noise realizations. And actually I indicated by W, I, and then bar J, which means that the noise is generated at node I, but relates to node J. So for each of your neighbors, you generate a noise realization. And then you compute self noise in a particular node i by summing up those variables. And the vijs actually are simply the difference between the noise realization you generate in your node minus the noise realization that you generated in your neighboring node. So actually, we have to exchange information at the initialization phase. That has to be secure. I come back to that later, because otherwise there is no privacy. And by doing so, if we do this trick, actually, we see that the VIJ is constructed like this. That means that the VJI actually is minus VIJ because we have the same numbers and with the minus sign. Now, if you then construct the noise like this, you can show, if you just follow the math, that this adds up to zero. So this is a trick to guarantee that the noise adds up to zero. Question then, what is the privacy actually the individual privacy we have. So now we have forced perfect utility because the noise adds to zero. Now, how about the privacy in this case? Well, the privacy, then we first have to see what do the adversaries know? Well, obviously the eavesdroppers, 
they know, know all the axes. X is what is transmitted through the network. Obviously, the corrupted nodes itself, they have the secrets. And they know, of course, this noise that is added to the secrets. But they know a little bit more. They know the VJLs. So those are the, the noise components, actually, that has been shared, exchanged with your neighbor, which you can use to calculate the VJ. But you know a little bit more because the VJLs are also used at your neighbor to generate the noise in that particular node. So if you then check what is the information released between a secret at node I and everything is observed, well, then actually it's you get an expression like this. So that is the, the, the mutual information between the secret at I and everything that the adversaries can generate. And what do they know? And so they observe the access, so what is transmitted, and we know that that is what is transmitted is the secret plus noise. But they cannot generate the noise realization because they don't have knowledge of it. The only thing that they can generate is the secret plus part of the noise, and the noise that is actually originating to the honest neighbors, they have no idea what it is because this noise actually has been ex exchanged between honest nodes and the corrupted nodes do not know those values. Yeah, so they observe all the XJs and XJs from the XJs is a part is unknown. And actually that what is unknown is the secret itself because that part of the noise that has been exchanged among honest nodes. Now, what you see here, if you add everything together, just by construction, because all the VJLs, if you add everything together, adds up to zero by construction, you see that you can reconstruct the sum of all SJs. Yeah. So you can see that it is, it is lower bounded by this. And this is really the lower bound. And this is what you can what you can get in the end, at least the, the corrupted nodes, because the corrupted nodes, they know the average of the shares, but they also know the number of nodes. So if you multiply the average by the number, you have the total sum. Well, the, the, the corrupted nodes can calculate the sum of the corrupted nodes, you subtract the sum of the corrupted nodes, and what is left is the sum of the honest nodes. So this is really the lowest mutual information you can get in this scenario. Now, now how do we get that actually? If you then compare, how, if you go from here to here, when do we have equality? Well, actually what we need then is that there is no information between secret SI and everything that can be observed from all the other nodes. Now, what you see already what happens here. So we, what we should do is you sh should make this sufficiently large, the noise actually that we add. And if this part of the noise is sufficiently large, then the mutual information becomes sufficiently small. And indeed, if we would like to have it exactly zero, then we need infinite many, uh, infinitely large uh, variants. So that's not, not practical at all. But this is the, this is the idea. Yeah. So um, adding noise actually will introduce security here, while the utility here is optimal, it's zero. What do we pay for this, this nice property? Actually, well, if this is not here, so that means there are no honest nodes, so everything else around you is corrupt, then actually there is no noise that is not available to the corrupted noise. And actually, then you see you get mutual information between SI and SI, and, and, and everything is, is, is revealed to the corrupted nodes. Yeah, so in contrast to differential, part, uh, differential privacy, where everyone can be corrupt except yourself, uh, here we need one corrupt, uh, sorry, one, one honest node. So if we have one honest node, then actually we can apply this tricky. So what have we seen so far? So with differential privacy, there is a fundamental trade off between privacy and utility. The more privacy, the lower the utility. Um, I can use zero sum noise addition. Uh, in that case, we have perfect utility without compromising privacy. Yeah? So I can just have perfect utility and still I can control the amount of privacy. Differential privacy works in the case that every other node is corrupt. For zero sum noise um, addition, we require at least one honest node. But the downside of this zero sum noise addition actually is that it doesn't really generalize to more complex problems than average consensus. And that's actually what we would like to solve. For example, I want to train uh, some kind of model using machine learning techniques, things like that, least squares problems, classification problems, things like that. So can we solve this type of problems 
in a privacy preserving way. Well, actually, one way how we can do that is the following, and um, that's an algorithm that we, we developed uh, actually at, uh, in Delft. Um, so what we do here, we consider the minimization of the sum of convex functions. Yeah? So the convex functions typically are cost functions. So this is a typical setting for machine learning like uh, algorithms. So I want to minimize the sum of convex functions over a graph. Yeah? So the problem actually is given that I want to minimize the sum of those functions. They are separable. So each node has its own cost function and its own variable. And in the end, I would like to reach consensus. That means I would like to have xi equal to xj on every edge. Now, if you assume that the network is connected, that means that all xi's are the same in the end. So this is a consensus problem, but the function that we can minimize can be quite arbitrary. Now, examples of, of this type of, of, of algorithms, I can just calculate, take this local cost function to be this, this quadratic function. If you plug it in, you calculate what is the optimal solution. The optimal solution actually is the average value over the AIs. Yeah, so the average consensus problem that I talked about before can be solved in this framework by taking fi xi to be this quadratic function. And in this case, AI is the private data or the secret data. I can also solve more complex, uh, more complicated problems like uh, lasso problem. So actually it's uh, an, a least squares problem where I would like to find a, a sparse solution. So that's actually the reason that we have this, uh, this L1 regularizer here in the end of and so Now, the, what is the, the, the secret data here? It's not just an AI, no, it's a BI here in the matrix AI. Yeah, so the secret data can be a set of, uh, of, of variables that you could, would like to keep secret for the outside uh, world. How do we solve it? <clears throat> I'm not going into detail here. I just give you the update equations because they are relevant for, um, for the remaining of this, uh, this talk. So the update equations, they look like this. So I have to solve some kind of minimization. I can do that for each and every node. And once I have solved this xi, I can calculate this term here. And well, this is all function of ij and that is sent to node j. So this last step actually means uh, data exchange. Yeah? So this is just a local minimization and then you exchange information. So in this method, the only thing that I exchange are Z parameters, which we call the auxiliary variables. Now in this case, the, uh, that's here important that if we have N nodes, that the prime of variable X is of dimension N, whereas the auxiliary variable, that's the one that we are going to optimize over, is of dimension two M where M is the number of edges in the network. And typically this is much larger than N, yeah, so there is the dimension of the of the variable that we are optimizing over is much larger than the dimension of the uh, of the x factor. And actually, that's what we will exploit later on, because we will put noise in the space that is not used to optimize x, and that noise actually we will use to actually uh, obfuscate our private data. Um, well, what are the convergence results of of of, of this algorithm? Actually. Um, it can be shown, and that's shown in this paper here, is that um, if the function f is differentiable and strongly convex, then we have perfect output utility, yeah? like the quadratic function. So if you want to compute the average value, this works pretty fine. If not, if the function is not differentiable and not strongly convex, like the Lasso problem, what we can do then, we can do an averaging step. So instead of taking the t of c of k itself, I only take a fraction of theta of this result and I keep one minus theta the fraction of the previous result. So it's you take a, some kind of conservative step uh, towards the future. Now, if you take theta equal to, to half, then actually it turns out what you can show that's also done in this paper that this is exactly what is the ADMM algorithm. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, optimization, but ADMM is, I would say, by far the popu most popular uh, optimization algorithm that is used uh, uh, in, in this type of settings. Okay. So what do we transmit? So we have to transmit the Z's, but we will not transmit the Z's directly. Now I will do this differentially. So I will just transmit the Delta Z's. Yeah? So instead of transmitting, this is the example at hand. Yeah? So this is my network. Suppose I can update X, the, the, the local X variable at node one. And then actually I construct the Z21. So that's the information I sent to node two originating from node one. And I do the same for my other neighbor. I construct Z3 
uh, bar one, but instead of transmitting that directly, I transmit on the difference. And there are more reasons for doing that. First of all, this is interesting from a communication efficiency point of view, but to obtain security, this is what we have to do. Yeah, so I just transmit the difference between the CJI at iteration K plus one and the one at the previous iteration. So if I want to construct this one, well, the only thing I have to add, I take the one in the previous iteration, I add the difference. And if you do this repeatedly, I can write it like this. So basically I have an initial value plus everything that I transmit over the channel. What do the adversaries know? Well, the passive adversary, what do they know? Well, obviously um, they can calculate the X values in their nodes. Yeah, that's that, that uh, and plus of course, the Z's and the Delta Z's. So that is everything that they compute in the notes itself. What do the eavesdropper notes? Well, actually the eavesdropper knows all Delta Z IJs, all Delta Z IJs in the complete network. And knowing this, you can see, okay, what is then the privacy leakage? Now, then we have to check actually, what is it? What is known by the um, corrupted notes? And then I have to take a look to the optimality condition. So if you just, uh, let, let me just go back to the original problem. This is the problem. So X, X, I, K plus one is the argument that minimizes this. So basically, assuming this is differentiable, what I have to do to calculate X, I, K plus one, I have to take the derivative of this one and set it equal to zero. And that's what is done here in the top equation. Well, this is a little bit more general. It also includes non-differentiable functions, but this is what you need to do. So this is what you can calculate. Now, what is now known and what is unknown to the to the ad adversaries? Well, actually, the adversaries, they can calculate x i k plus one, because if you collect all the z's, it's easy to calculate the x i's. This you do not know. This is the, yeah, the gradient or subgradient at the particular node. And that contains basically the private data. Yeah, in the case of a quadratic function, the distributed averaging problem, this gradient is actually the secret data. But this could be also a little bit more complex. At least the gradient here is a function of the subgradient. In this case, is a um, is a function of the secret data. What else do we know? Well, actually, you can calculate at least the CIJs of the corrupted nodes because you know what has been transmitted and you know the original um, initial initializations at the corrupted nodes. So the only thing actually that is left unknown is this gradient plus the sum of well the CIJ zeros, not K, because the delta Ks are transmitted and they're eavesdropped. The only thing actually that, that is not known is the initialization of those variables ZIJ only at the honest nodes. And if you look to these equations, this looks pretty much to the noise addition that we have seen before, where this is the private data. It sits in the, in this case, in, in, in the gradient or the subdifferential in this case. And then you add something and that adding something we can actually consider to be noise. Yeah, so what we can do, we can just initialize our algorithm. The ZIJs are the initialized values of our algorithm by noise. And by doing so, everything that the adversaries can infer from the secret, which is somewhere hidden in this subdifferential, is this plus the sum of unknown values. And that is it. Now, in order to, to, to make this work, quite similar to this noise addition is that at the initialization, we have to communicate the CIJs to neighbors in a secure way. So we only need, I would say, um, cryptographic tools at the initialization phase. And other than that, it's not necessary anymore because there we get information security um, because we just add noise to the secrets and actually the secrets cannot be uh, uh, recovered. That, that's basically what it is. Okay, so now what is, done, what is done the individual privacy? Well, it's a bit more complicated here, but what you can show is that the individual privacy here is quite similar to what we had, what we had with um, the, the secure multi-party computation. That means that it's always larger than the lower bound, which is actually the mutual information between the secret and the sum of the owner's notes. And we have equality if and only if, well, a similar structure. So what we have to do, we have to make the noise here sufficiently large yeah we have to make the noise sufficiently large again again if this is not there we refill everything so we need at least one honest node and secondly what's interesting here apparently this noise here depends on k 
Yeah, because every iteration, Z is updated. And the question then is, what happens actually to the Zs? Now, so the question here is that as the iterations proceed, does the variance of the auxiliary variable actually decrease and thereby partly revealing the private information? Well, the good news is, no, it's not. Uh, it will not disappear. And actually, I will not go into the detail here, but what is important here, and that's, uh, that, that's, that, that, that's what it says here. It turns out that only a certain subspace of this, where the Z vector lives, is used to update X. That subspace is, is what we call S. And it turns out that if you initialize the Z in this S space, the Z remains in the S space, and actually it will converge. And at the same time, X will converge. On the other hand, if you take this Z, the initialization of Z, in the orthogonal complement, all the Z case will stay in the orthogonal complement. Yeah, so that means you can actually, the initialization can split it in two parts. And actually, that's what it says here. I can have a part in the space that affects the update of X and a part that does not have any effect on X. And it turns out that at iteration K, the component that is in that or orthogonal subspace only depends on the initialization, on the initialization. And of course, of theta, and that is actually is the averaging constant. So what is the conclusion here? That if you look to the expected value, so this is the covariance matrix of the initialization, suppose that's just uncorrelated noise with noise variance sigma square. Then actually the components in the orthogonal subspace are, well, depending on the value of theta, but are on the order of magnitude sigma square or sigma square over two. And they do not become smaller than that. And that's also what you can see in the next plot. So what you see here, we have the noise variance as a function of the iterations. And what you see here is, is a uh, initialize. So actually here we initialize with a sigma of 10 to the power of three. And then for different values of, of, of theta zero, theta zero in this case is the, or, or the, the original PDMM algorithm. You always keep a large variance here. Uh, in the case half, it's actually it's ADMM here. You have a constant value which is approximate of which is approximate which is half the value that we have here and any other value you see it immediately drops down to this value here and also stays at the reasonably large value if you increase the value 10 to the power 4 well same story you see that if you initialize the z values with noise and the noise variance is sufficiently large the noise variance will remain there and actually that's remaining noise variance actually will contribute to the privacy uh, of your secret data. I will skip this one. Uh, okay. So what you see here, this is, the, this is the, the, a comparison actually between the three methods. So we have DOSP, that is the subspace perturbation. We have secure multi-party computation, the red lines and the black lines is uh, different to privacy. And if you just look to the lines with the circles, that means there is no noise added, actually. So we have initialized our algorithm with all zeros, and there is no noise added here and no noise added here. And then you get those curves. These are the curves. So you see, yes, you get perfect output utility because the error goes to zero for DUSP, but also for differential privacy and also for secure multi-party computation. But if you increase now the noise variance here, then actually you get the following results that DUSP actually still converges quite well. Same convergence rate, by the way, as it had here. Yeah. Here, actually, you get this is the, uh, the, the secure multi-party computation. It also converges. See, it's a little bit slow, but it also converges. But if you then look to differential privacy, and that's what we know already, if you add noise, then actually the output utility will be limited. Yeah. And if you increase the very noise variance even more, Output utility even get worse. Yeah. While the other ones in both secure multi-party computation and this uh, DOSP actually will guarantee converge to the optimal solution. Now the advantage of, of DOSP over secure multi-party computation is obviously that I can solve any complex, uh, sorry, any complex uh, constraint optimization problem. Yeah? So that's that's a quite broad class. Now the last part, actually, I would like to say a few words on is. Transmission rate, because it's important, because the point is, if you obfuscate the data by noise, then actually the bit rate will increase, yeah, because the uncertainty will increase in the data, and uncertainty is directly related to number of bits that you need to represent. It. Yeah, so if we have noisy data, so secret plus noise, 
And we're going to quantize that using a quantizer with a step size delta. This is the step size of the quantizer. And then you can show that the entropy of the quantized data, which corresponds to the number of bits you need to represent it, can be upper bounded by uh, those quantities. And if you plug in for the noise variance, the equation that we have seen before, such that the mutual information is no larger than epsilon, you see that this is some kind of an upper bound of the number of bits that you need to spend. Now, if you just draw a plot, and that's what I do did here, is that you can see the smaller epsilon, the more bits you need. Yeah, And also, of course, when this, the variance of the source increases, the number of bits will increase. So before you know, you have to spend many, many bits per iteration. So the question is, can we do something about that? Well, obviously, you can quantize the data, but we know that if you quantize the data, then actually you will uh, lower the final accuracy because you are introducing noise. Question is now, can we use differential coding? And because what we transmit is not the Z values itself, but are the delta Z values. And actually what we know is that the delta Z values, they will become zero in the end. Because at the moment that the algorithm will converge is that the difference between successive Z, Z vectors will be small, actually goes to zero. Well, actually, if the difference becomes to zero, then actually we also don't have to spend any bits there. Well, maybe one, two bits per, per sample. On the other hand, when you start the iterations, delta Z is quite large. But we know that the algorithm will convert for any initialization. So we don't care about the initialization. We can just coarsely quantize the initial value. And it turns out that even with one bit quantizer, so we represent the delta Z by one bit, so I'm only transmitting the sign, that you can still get full uh, full precision. Let me say a few more words about this. So what we do is actually we transmit quantized delta Z's. Yeah, so it's the quantized delta Z's, and that will actually you can write it as the delta Z itself plus the quantization error. So Q here denotes the quantization error. And if you fill that in in the update equations, then actually it turns out that the quantized Z's that you get are basically the true Cs plus the quantization error that you have introduced in quantizing the deltas. This is what you get. And so instead of working with the Z JIs, I work with the Z hat JIs, which are noisy versions of the C JIs. Now, what you can show is that those quantized PDMM update equations are what we call inexact krasnoselsky mon iterations. And this is known in literature that if the quantization noise, and all the Qs at iteration K are an absolutely summable sequence, yeah, so the sum of the absolute values is finite, then actually still xk will convert to x star. Yeah, so even though I have quantized the data, still the algorithm will perfectly solve my problem. Yeah, but I have to make sure that the quantization is absolutely summable, which means actually if k gets large, the quantization error should become smaller and smaller and smaller. And it should become smaller fast enough. Well, if we now assume, and we have seen that in the plots, we have a geometric convergence rate. So that actually is the straight line on the log scale. And the, that's, the, the, that's how the error will decrease. Then also the range of your delta C will decrease by the same amount. So what we will do here, I will adapt my step size of the quantizer according to this converging factor gamma. And if you do that, so you make it smaller and smaller and smaller at each and every iteration, and you make it smaller, well, corresponding to gamma, you can show that the sum of the quantization error is indeed finite. And that means that the algorithm will converge. Now, here I have some simulation results. So what you see here is the error as a function of number of iterations. And first one, the blue line, is when I do everything 64 bits on my MacBook. Then I can quantize the ZIJs itself, not the delta ZIJs, just the ZIJs by 16 bit. And then you see that quantization doesn't have any effect on the convergence rate, but at a certain level, actually, it starts to saturate because the utility actually is uh, cannot be any, become any better. Well, you can go to 8 bit, but if you use one bit differential coding, so I just quantize the delta Cs with only one bit, actually, this is the result. So the, 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 so the rate at convergence is almost the same as if I use the full 64 precision bit, but now I only have to transmit one bit per iteration and still everything is fine. 
Now, the last question that we need to answer then, does it have any effect here on the utility? Yeah, does it have any effect on the utility? Well, then we have to check the individual privacy here. Now, what you can show that if you do this trick, then what is unknown or what is known to the, to the corrupted nodes is still the gradient where the private data is hidden in plus my noise that actually prevents the corrupted nodes to reveal uh, my secret, plus a term actually that is that corresponds to the conversation noise. Now, what you see here is that this Q conversation noise actually it goes to zero in the end. So if you wait and K gets large, this will simply disappear and you get exactly the same privacy conditions as we had before without conversation. Actually, conversation helps you a little bit because in the original problem, when there was no conversation, the initialization of the Z's actually were the reason for obfuscating my private data. And now on top of that, I also have something due to conversation, which is very nice because if I stop the conversation of the, the iterations at a certain point without full convergence, then this term is not zero and it just acts as additional noise. In fact, you can say even if all neighbors are corrupted, and that means that this one is zero, you still have a certain amount of security, like in differential privacy, due to the conversation noise. So you see by stopping the iterations at a certain point, you can just, well, shift between full subspace perturbation and differential privacy, and you can just find your, your optimal way. Okay. Well, let me just conclude. Here, so what we have seen here, I introduced you the what we call the primal dual method of multipliers, and it's a distributed optimization algorithm. It can be used to solve uh, many, uh, I would say, almost arbitrary convex optimization problems, uh, where you have a constraint like uh, uh, consensus constraints, things like that. Uh, this algorithm is privacy preserving. Uh, have we seen if you add uh, noise with sufficiently large variance, and this noise actually is the initialization. It's communication efficient, it's computational efficient. And last but not least, and I didn't say anything about this, the algorithm is also asynchronous. So what I showed here is uh, everything for synchronous update schemes, because the analysis is much simpler. But recently, actually, is one of my master students who is going to graduate in two weeks. He showed that this algorithm also converges for in asynchronous settings, so stochastic settings and also preserves privacy in those stochastic settings. Yeah? So you can also use this to train, let's say, machine learning models uh, where you would like to have stochastic uh, uh, optimization. Methods. Brings me to the last slide, and that's actually the acknowledgement because obviously I didn't do the work myself. Actually, they did the work and I just looked over their shoulder. You know how that works. Eh? And that is, uh, first of all, uh, Go Chang and Tom. Uh, from Delft University, uh, Jake Jungman, also from Delft, and uh, Chung Shuli from Aalborg University. And this actually is in chronological order. And if I would have presented this in order of importance, I should just reverse the order because uh, Chung Shu actually she did most of the work on privacy. And that was about, I think, 50% of this talk. And then Jake worked on conversation uh, effects. Okay. Thank you for listening. And I'm um, of course, willing to take any questions you ask. Um, I still think we have some time, Jackie. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, uh, first of all, impressive talk and uh, impactful results. Uh, I was really surprised to see all those uh, positive, uh, um, you know, uh, um, results. I have my own question, but I already see some something on the QIA two and A. Maybe uh, you want to take a look. It says. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, have you seen it? Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, actually, what we do here. Um, so I, I don't know if this answers your question, but what we do actually is this, this averaging problem. We go to this dual domain actually and apply, well, actually we do operator splitting in the dual domain. So that's the reason the Z variables that we work with basically are highly related to the dual variables. So and since the dimension of the dual variables is much larger than the dimension of the primal variables, that actually is the reason that you create space to put noise and actually and the noise will, will stay there. 
So does this answer your question? Uh, Okay, thank you. Um, if there's not any other question, we have a couple of minutes left uh, before the session ends. Mm -hmm. um, Richard, um, do you have any students in pipeline to try these methods in a machine learning setting or so? To see? Yes, yes, yes. Actually, the new student will start soon. And uh, soon is just after the summer holidays. Yeah. Okay. So actually, it's she, and uh, she will look to. Uh, uh, federate learning and in particular what's interesting there is to see so what we do here actually then I can protect the gradient and it's also interesting to see how much information can you infer from looking to the gradients uh, about the, well, the, the underlying uh, data yeah so that's actually what we are going to work on, uh, on, on, on uh, in the near future okay um, I think also... you have any other suggestions of course yeah. Uh, I have a student also looking for the privacy of existing federated uh, machine learning uh, algorithms. Right. And we are looking also in the gradients and initial results say that actually they are not that much privacy preserving. Maybe okay. we should uh, come together and uh, talk. Yeah. That's, uh, that's um, I'm looking around uh, for any other questions, um, but uh, thank you very much once again, Richard. This was a really nice talk and uh, impressive results. And hopefully I will see you in our next events of IEEE SPS. Uh, for your information, in July, we will have another webinar. And the talk uh, I can already tell you now, it's about uh, uh, real world challenges faced by law enforcement. Uh, it will be given by Martino uh, Gerian from uh, Ampet Software from Italy. Uh, you will get the invitations uh, very soon. But um, until then, please take care and uh, have a nice day already. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.